It's been 75 years, but survivors argue their memories of nuclear attacks still need to be heard. This week, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the anniversary too important to cancel. Welcome to The Travel Show, coming to you this week from Hiroshima, around 900 kilometers southwest of Tokyo. 75 years ago, the world's first atomic bomb fell on this city, killing tens of thousands of people in a blinding flash of light. And three days later, another bomb fell on Nagasaki. In this week's show, we'll be meeting the survivors of those attacks and seeing how events designed to mark the 75th anniversary have fared during the global pandemic also coming up on this week's show. Krista uncovers the wartime secrets buried deep beneath Gibraltar. We meet the people still trapped a long way from home because of COVID-19. We feel like hostage here on board as we have no choice except being in our cabin. And Rajan gets to grips with some new gadgets designed for a perfectly socially distanced holiday. I've come to a city in Japan that's known all around the world, but it's known for just one event, the devastation and destruction caused by an American nuclear bomb dropped on this city 75 years ago this month, during the final days of the Second World War. Today though, much of Hiroshima looks like any other Japanese city. In fact, coronavirus aside, it's doing well. This exhibition shows how the city has blossomed since. ただ、ま、本当にま、その each August, the city commemorates the event, but as this year's big 75th anniversary approached, coronavirus has severely restricted what was possible. ま、so this is to remember the dead. Uh, this is in honor of those who died, and families come here and offer prayers for the souls of those who died. Uh, At Hiroshima's Peace Park, an area that was once one of the city's busiest commercial hubs but was flattened by the blast, has been made into a focus for its annual commemorations. About 60 or 70,000 people were killed on that day, and mostly because of the radiation and injuries, up to 100,000 people died by the end of 1945. And what's been the effect on Hiroshima today? It has scarred the city. People were terrified of radiation and people stayed away from Hiroshima. People who were from here were discriminated against. And it took the town a long time to rebuild, but in its rebuilding, one of its focuses was on trying to seek to eliminate nuclear weapons in the world. So it's really always remained a central defining aspect of this city's experience and this city's focus. The testimony of survivors here can reveal Japan's difficult relationship with memories of the Second World War. The number of survivors are dwindling every year, 
and this year's ceremonies will be the last significant anniversary many will attend. But despite the limitations placed on proceedings because of the pandemic, many are still eager to come out and tell their story. そういう状況で被爆しました。爆心地から4キロ地点で家の中でですけど、もう本当に家はめちゃめちゃに壊れたんですけれども、爆弾の落ちた形跡はありませんでしたね。で、ま時間の経過はわからないんですけど、しばら
all the day. Now, another group of people who have been particularly hard hit by changing government policies are Australians. As cases rise, strict arrival caps have been imposed, leaving people stranded. Airlines have been forced to limit the number of passengers on their flights, pushing up ticket prices and making returning home even more out of reach. I'm originally from the UK, uh, but I've lived in Australia now for a number of years and I'm married to a, an Australian. We're all Australian citizens. We've got four kids. We came on holiday initially in early March for a three-week holiday to visit family in the UK and, and we've been trapped here ever since, stranded. And it's now getting on for, for about four and a half months. The main challenge is that they've got a small house and there's six of us. So um, we're filming this where I actually sleep. This is my dad's um, study in a shed in the garden. And the uncertainty of not knowing when that would stop has been particularly difficult. When the Australians decided to put um, limitations on the number of people arriving because of pressures on quarantine, the airlines have, ha have actually been forced to discriminate against the economy passengers. And so we've, be we've actually been removed from a couple of flights. So it's not that we don't want to get home. It's not that we haven't been trying to get home. We've done everything in our financial means to get home, but we're just, we're just not able to. British citizen Tom Russell has been stranded in Accra, Ghana, where his one-week research trip turned into a five-month aid operation. I was due to fly out of Ghana the day after the borders closed, and I've had 10 flights cancelled since. The trick is to accept that you're stuck somewhere, and as soon as you, you do that, you just get on with, with life as much as you can, as opposed to kind of dwelling on it. And that's exactly what Tom did by setting up Give Back Ghana. The project started when Tom made seven boxes containing enough food for one family for one week, which he then handed out to locals who had helped him during his trip. Five months on and crowdfunding and a business grant have enabled Tom and his Ghanaian business partner to put together thousands of boxes to help families most in need across Accra. Having a project that's connected me to the community is, I think, completely changed the experience for the positive. I've met so many people through doing this. Every part of it has given the time some value as well. I would like to see my friends and family, but the project's on here and I've got to run with what I've started. Well, let's hope they all make it home safely soon. Well, still to come on The Travel Show. Rajan's got some suggestions for ways to keep your travel bubble intact if you're heading off on holiday. And Krista finds there's more to Gibraltar than first meets the eye. Well, with the world slowly returning to some kind of normality, it's only natural that people are wondering where they can go on their next trip. But what do you do if you want to remain socially distant from others but are still desperate for some kind of holiday? Well, Rajan might just have the answer. Thanks, Carmen. Well, yes, with fears of a second imminent wave of the virus and spikes being reported across the globe, the idea of social distancing while traveling, it does sound like a good one. Conventional crowded summer hotspots like beaches, theme parks and busy cities are being avoided by many people in favour of more rural locations to allow for social distancing. So with all of this going on, it's hardly surprising that some fun but pretty unconventional ways of travelling are rising in popularity. Around the world, businesses have been creating innovative ways for people to still have fun travelling whilst remaining safe. According to the manufacturers, the Cuckoo Camping Module is a mini mobile home in a box, which means you have everything you need in one place to set off on a wild adventure without seeing a single soul, if that's your thing. How easy is it to turn this into a mobile home? Let's do it. OK. Developed by a husband and wife duo in Germany back in 2011, the boxes are now being used all over the globe. Wow. Voila. Amazing. As easy as that. Tell me, where did the idea come from? Prior to this, pretty much, if someone wanted to use their own vehicle, it was airbed mattresses laying on a cold floor, not very convenient, not all of their kit in one space. 
Again, it's a proper stove. A proper yeah. stove. It allows you to have an adventure, effectively, in the vehicle that you already own and be able to social distance if you needed to or wish to. And moving directly from the campsite to the open water. What if I told you that you could buy a caravan that you can move from land to water and sail it out to sea? Kind of James Bond for campers, right? Daniel, tell me, where did the idea for the Sealander come from? My goal was to bring a new and innovative craft uh, to the a kind of old dated caravan market, uh, especially for people who are looking for more freedom and more flexibility in their leisure time. I think the solution uh, is a kind of a dream of everybody. So it's not just physical, it's also a symbolic for possibilities to follow your own path. I guess ultimately, Daniel, the beauty of this is that you can literally travel all the way across land and in water without actually getting out necessarily or certainly not meeting other people. Like the soul of our product, you are free to do whatever you want and wherever you want. With hotel occupancy rates down globally and the virus not showing any signs of leaving us anytime soon, is the uptrend in socially distant travelling just a fad? I, I don't think it will be a trend. Um, I, I feel that the quicker we find the vaccine, there's a possibility we will go back to as it was before. I think if it takes longer, we'll actually learn the lesson about this. We'll appreciate travel more. Everything's become very homogenous. Um, and actually the reason behind traveling in the first place is that we wanted to explore and see something different, not something the same. And I think we've lost the plot a bit that way. What kind of activities, what kind of holidays can you see prospering in the future in this new world? Outdoor travel will become big. Um, adventure travel will become big. Um, touring holidays where you've got very small groups, um, so you've got about four or five people per guide. There's a lot of stuff on our doorstep that looks like overseas. One of my favourite countries in the world is Canada. I absolutely adore it. Now, I'm not going to go to it this year, but Scotland is like a, a mini Canada. So there's a lot of places which will resonate, and we've got plenty of opportunity to social distance, whatever our budget. To finish up this week, we head back to some of the darkest days of World War II. And the British territory of Gibraltar was vital for Allied access to the Mediterranean, but its very location made it vulnerable to enemy attack, which is why a secret network of tunnels was built there. Back before lockdown, Chris had headed there to discover some of its hidden past. This tiny territory on Europe's southern tip has been the subject of fierce diplomatic wrangling for years. Spain claims sovereignty, but it's been ruled by Britain since 1713. Tourists have always come here to take in the sunshine and feed the famous Barbary macaques. And it's not hard to see why this rock has been such a prized military asset too, especially during the Second World War. Up here on top of the rock, you can really get a sense for why this was so important strategically during the war. As we follow the map, you can see the mountains of Africa off to one side, and then we've got Spain on either side of the rock. And then, of course, the entrance to the Mediterranean from the Atlantic. So, I mean, a really important place, this. And inside the rock itself, work has been going on, which is revealing a thousand years of history, including information on how this place was repurposed as a military HQ. Gibraltar is a fortress and it's covered with fortifications, but not just on the outside. In fact, Gibraltar is honeycombed with tunnels and there's 34 miles of tunnel inside the rock, which is more than double the amount of roads we've got on the outside. So yes, Gibraltar is a living fortress. Opens right up. These tunnels, they all connect up and there's hospitals, there's kitchens, there's a bakery, there's frozen food stores. The plan was to be able to house and cater for 16,000 men 16, and women. 16,000? Yes. These rooms used to be the King's Regiment headquarters. But one discovery in the 1990s stunned Gibraltarians the infamous stay-behind cave. All to do with an urban myth 
that was hanging around town. People used to talk about this, about hidden tunnels, um, secret tunnels. And so for many years, people th were looking for them, but nobody ever found anything. And so by the 1990s, it was dismissed as an urban myth. It's a myth. Until one day, some of the cavers found something. <laughs> If Gibraltar were to fall into enemy hands, a top secret plan called Operation Tracer was in place to bury six men in the rock with one year's supply of food. Their job was to spy and radio back intelligence to the UK. What do we have here? This is what would have been the main living chamber. This is the, if you look at the floor, it's been covered by cork tiles. Now, the idea of this was to suppress any noise so that the men wouldn't make any noise when they were living here. This would have been the radio shack. All right. The, oh, and latrines. Of the six people chosen, there were two radio operators, a doctor, an officer, and a signalman. And then here we have the remains of the bicycle. And instead of a bicycle chain, it had a leather strap and then that would have provided a means of generating electricity to power their radio. And also at the back you can see there's like a fan attached to what would have been the back wheel. And the idea of that was that that was going to provide ventilation. The plan was for the men to hide and monitor air traffic on and off the runway and shipping movements into the Med, the Bay of Gibraltar and the Atlantic. This was their only access to daylight. So this was a really plumb spot. That's why they chose this particular point of view. Access here is limited, but through Gibraltar Museum, up to 30 people a year are allowed to visit the Stay Behind Cave, based on a first-come, first-served basis. exploring some hidden World War II history there in Gibraltar. Well, that's it for this week. We'll be back again with another new travel show very soon. Next week, there's another chance to see Rajan making his way down the mighty River Sava in the Balkans. Yeah. Well, join Rajan for that if you can. But in the meantime, from me, Carmen Roberts, and the rest of the travel show team here in Japan, it's goodbye. Oh, <laughs>